Joy, why don't we start with you since you're at the top of my screen? Ah, fun. All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Joy Chevalier. I own the Cook's Nook here in Austin, and uh, I happen to be a board member of Naturally Austin um, and uh, several other things around town, including the uh, Food Policy Board uh, here in uh, Central Texas. And uh, the Cook's Nook, I founded after spending almost 20 years as a technologist running very large global programs and, and starting uh, pretty hardcore data, data technologies and uh, decided to go into food and tech and uh, open uh, the Cook's Nook, which is a culinary incubator. So we work with uh, entrepreneurs. We also work with corporates in a variety of arenas. And also we have a food services group that's also part of the Cook's Nook. And I spent a lot of time on policy and impact and community as well. So yeah, stay pretty busy. And then 2018 actually ran for office and ran for comptroller of the state of Texas as well. So you can find me around town. Joy, I think you're you're more than a little busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, typically. <laughs> I occasionally get to sleep. Awesome. Well, Kirsten, let's go with you next. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten Ross. I am the managing director of SKU, which is a consumer products good accelerator here in Austin. Um, and I'm also on the board of Naturally Austin and doing um, a lot to um, bring to life uh, a joint program that Naturally Austin and SKU are launching um, this year for diversity and inclusion. And um, in my role at SKU, I just get to help support founders um, and create an ecosystem and a network um, of individuals who really can help accelerate consumer product good companies. Um, and with all that being said, Joy, I wish I was busy like you changing the world, but <laughs> changing more diapers than that right now with three young kids. <laughs> Um, so it's taking up a lot of time. Yeah, um, I mean, your house is always busy. It's always busy over here. But um, <laughs> I'm so excited to be part of this panel with two women that I very much so respect. And of course, you, Katrina, as well. <laughs> okay, Bianca, all you. Hi, I'm Bianca Carey with Carey Business Solutions and Taxfee. Um, I, my main focus is small business startup to make sure that they have the financial foundation is very important to me so that in the, when in, individuals get an idea that they do it the right way and they build it up so that they can keep it. So the lens that and the perspective that I come in is from a financial standpoint to make sure that you're building your businesses with a solid foundation and that you're ready. You're ready when in the pipeline when it comes to getting your products in um, a supermarket, in a big chain store, or if you're going to sell and build your company up for um, equity. So I just want to make sure that people understand how your fundamental financial foundation changes everything about your business and how you can leverage capital by having a solid foundation. Yes, thank you so much for that. The lens that I'm coming in with is that I fully believe that um, entrepreneurship is transformational. This is my family's story. And this, this is something that I'm very passionate about and empowering um, people, particularly people of color, because it can change your family's story and every generation after that. So I just want to build um, a little bit of context as we start this conversation. So some common stats that you see out there, this one's from a recent Forbes article, the average net worth of African Americans is $11,000 versus $144,000 for white Americans, which makes sense why black entrepreneurs on average only raise $35,000 in a friends and family round compared to over $110,000 for a white entrepreneur. So one of the common themes that we have touched on again and again today is that the it is so important uh, to build an ecosystem for yourself and to plug into an ecosystem that exists. What I would love to ask you all is what are some of the other invisible invisible constraints that make it harder for a founder of color to start a small CPG business or plug into a community outside of just the funding? Um, I would say you mentioned about family and friends, right? So most African-American or minority people are first generational 
So when they have an idea, the, the innate support is not there because nobody around them in their ecosystem have done it before. So whereas people would have, other colors would have someone that would invest in their business where the income level does not support investment in some of your family and friends business because they don't have the capital or the disposable income to invest in their dreams too. So those invisible barriers like family makeup and things that have happened prior to in history for sure um, is a, a barrier that allow people not to have the resources and the capital they need in order to start their businesses successfully. So that's one thing, but I can go on and on. <laughs> So one thing I'd love to add to that um, is just the community that fosters that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I just think about myself growing up in Minnesota, and we have a SKU um, program that runs in Minnesota, and that community isn't just high risk taking. They haven't seen entrepreneurs. They're conditioned to really kind of follow big businesses. And I, I see that also in some groups of populations, especially in the minority population. If they don't have that kind of comfort level of taking those high risks to create their own business and seeing kind of the patterning of what that looks like within their own community, I, I don't think they always know that it's an option. Um, and I, you know, I think the capital is a huge portion of it, but I think it goes back to a, a more, you know, basic level of just, I didn't see it growing up. I didn't know it was an option. And so therefore I'm not, um, empowered with that risk-taking sort of personality that, you know, founders and entrepreneurs have. The representation uh, matters. Yeah. I, I would add also that the mo one of the most uh, common things that I usually hear and experience is an intimidation factor due to a language or a cultural competency that they believe that they don't necessarily have. It is, I don't necessarily have the language or the words or a belief that I don't have um, the knowledge to go out and have that conversation. Uh, not knowing where to source, not knowing where to find, not knowing how to ask, what is the financial conversation to have? What does that spread? What is it? What is a spreadsheet supposed to say to me? And what is that supposed to look like? What is that thing? And how do I gain the competence to use that tool? What is the language of business that I should have with a with a seed, a potential seed conversation or a potential angel conversation or a potential VC conversation? And what's the difference between those three things? or to even know that those three things exist, right? Um, is there a protocol? Is there a means or a method of acting that is uh, business? And, and people can get really hung up on those things. Um, and again, not having seen that or been exposed to that, um, people make a lot of assumptions about what they're supposed to know or do or act. Um, and you often have to tell people just to, you have to let that go. And that's that's learned ability is not innate. It didn't just sort of drop out of the sky. You're not born with it. We all learned it, you know, whether I gained it in corporate or someone learned it because of school or class or because they had somebody around them that taught it. It's all, it's all garnered and you can garner it. You can get it. Um, it's not a, it's not secret. Um, and it's shareable and it's findable, right? Yeah, um, I, and, and 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 not to be and not to be afraid that you're not going to get not going to be able to acquire it. Joy, I think you touch on a really important point there, though, when you're talking about the language and cultural competency. I think, you know, a lot of founders of color are already, and this is this is also something that I've found in myself, um, oftentimes in certain situations or, or you know, uh, industries, I was uh, either the only person of color in the room or the only woman mm -hmm. in the room, oftentimes both. And so I would often, I would sometimes find myself in this, this feeling where I didn't want them to think that I, that I felt like another. So I was afraid yeah. to, you know, look like another too. Yeah. So where are so if you're starting out and you have those you know you have those feelings as you're as you're getting off the ground what are some of the the resources that folks can um go take a look at what are some of the ways that we can we can battle that feeling yeah you know that feeling of you know we we generally call it imposter syndrome i like to 
break it down from just being generically imposter syndrome. Because I think that's too big to tackle. Because even when you have all those skills, you still have imposter syndrome. Oh, I right? have it every day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it still it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, but you can gain the skill sets you need to be able to make the decisions that you need to make day in and day out. Is is the way I try to try to call that right. So you know, if you discover that. I don't feel I know how to use a spreadsheet well enough to tell me the things that I need to know day in and day out. How do I take that piece off discreetly and go deal with it, right? There are lots of different ways to go do that and have that inform you, right? Uh, for instance, just example, right? Um, City of Austin Small Business Development Office has a standard um, thing that they offer, so does Score Austin very reasonably priced for a few hours. You do nothing but learn how to deal with spreadsheets. Or you're an MO, I suspect you're gonna do it. <laughs> you're gonna do it there too, right? Um, and like for 35 bucks, you can go take a class for $35 and you can get pretty good at it. You're never gonna be perfect, you don't need to be. You just need to be able to do the things you need to do today and get, get decent at it and achieve the goal you need to achieve today, <laughs> right? This is not that about being a specialist, right? Yeah. You can get to a point where someone else does that for you. But today yeah. it's you. <laughs> today it's you, right? And be okay with that and be comfortable with that, right? And let the rest go. Um, that, is, that is probably the easiest example, the most discreet example. Um, and that's not bad. 35 bucks for you know two to four hours, right? To be able to tell you. How do I figure out costs? How do I figure out value? How do I track my burn rate? How do I be able to talk about this in a decent way? Figure out my, my top line, figure out my profit, my margins, and the things I, I need to know and understand today. Right? Joy, so we, have a, we have a quick question in the chat um, asking about where these classes are. Do you mind repeating that for the audience one more time? Sure. The City of Austin Small Business Development Office uh, offers them. SBA offers them both here in um, um, the, uh, the Success uh, Center, uh, uh, Entrepreneur Success Center, also the one out of uh, San Marcos um, at Texas State offers it. Also, Score Austin will also offer them in their classes. EGBI will also offer them. So, multiple groups will all often offer a basic sort of Excel or sort of spreadsheet use class of some type. I, I wanna take that financial literacy component and um, point this towards Bianca. I know that this is work that you do all the time with so many CPG small businesses. And do you wanna talk a little bit about what are some of the, what are some of the, the biggest pitfalls that, um, that founders should be making sure that they take a look at, that they have a, a very strong hold on to that they can make strong financial decisions for their business. For me, I feel like the biggest thing is for a founder to learn the language of their business because how one thing affects one business may not pertain to your business. And looking at things as close as your vendors and paying attention to whether or not you have more than one vendor, because if that vendor goes out of business, it could affect your business. Making sure that you're getting the best cost for your products. Understand what gross profit margin is. Um, I like to say this all the time, revenue does not equal profit. You know, I, I get con um, conversations with individuals that say, hey, you know, I made $200,000 this year. You did not make two hundred thousand dollars this year. <laughs> How much did you profit? So, you know, for me, I think the best thing that an individual can do, a founder can do, is hone in on their business and don't listen to people outside because your cousins and your friends are going to have opinions, right? So, study the language of your business and know that my gross profit margin looks like this because these are the components that make up me selling my product. Now, after I get to my gross profit margin, what does operation expenses look like? And knowing that those two are di different sets of things and what affects our numbers and just paying attention to those things. And me more than anything in being in CPG, break even. How, how many products I have to sell to make a dollar, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I really want people to understand the importance of those things. And when you identify all of those things around your products, then you can talk about, you know, making money and how much, uh, you know, revenue you need in order to pay all of these bills before you can even pay yourself. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about, about CPG, because you can, you know, you know, we'll start someone, you know, you start someone with a spreadsheet and you talk about these numbers, but at the end of the day, you can eventually get to a point where you go, aha, if I sell a hundred, I'm profitable today. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you can get that, you know, that's, that's great when you can sort of consolidate to a single, you know, a single, a couple of single KPIs, right? That's, that's not a negative. That's, 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 that's one of the fun things, nice things about, about uh, CPG that, you know, it isn't the same necessarily in other, other food arenas. The second most important thing I want to say too is leverage technology, right? So during CPG, uh, spreadsheets are magnificent. So technology is going to be your friend, but also having a system where you can take you know, your sales on a transactional level that may be your point of sale and tying it into your financial system, right? Because, okay, you, you're going to know how much money you generate, but the expenses tied to the generation of that income matters too. So, you know, leverage technology in terms that at the end of the day, when it's time for you to run reports, you understand your sales reports, you understand your financial statements, and you understand your balance sheet because your profit and loss in your balance sheet matters just as much as your sales reports. And the biggest pitfall is pay sales taxes, right? <laughs> A lot of individuals get in sales tax trouble. Um, I want you all to really think of in terms that the sales taxes are just passed through. That is not your money. It belongs to the state of Texas. Joy could tell you that. <laughs> it totally belongs to the state of Texas. Please pay it. Yes, so don't even count it in the income. It resides on the balance sheet, okay? And so as you go through the MO program, though, if some of you are in the MO program, those are all the things that we're going to talk about. But if I had to give the important pointers, those will be it. Technology, sales taxes, and understanding your numbers. Kirsten, I'd love to hear from you on um, you know, some of the things that you've seen through the SKU program, what are some of those invisible constraints that founders of color, um, you know, what, what can they, what can they um, I think there's a vulnerability when you go into an accelerator program, right? What advice would you give founders of color as they go through SKU? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, just to dovetail on what Joy and Bianca are saying, I mean, knowing your numbers and understanding what you need to get to is like, the base. You've got to know that. But there's a lot of other areas where there's just um, a learning curve of understanding the nomenclature, understanding, you know, what points of distribution make sense to your um, to your business. Um, there's efficiencies. You don't want to be doing a, little, a few sales online, a couple in a convenience store, trying to get into HEB, and then also wanting to, you know, do bundle boxes with somebody who's reached out to you. There's so many shiny objects, and you really need to just know where your product should reside, what that growth plan and strategy is, and not be intimidated by what you don't know. So within SKU, I mean, typically founders are the visionaries. They're the ones who are going out there, who created this product, ha have a lot of uh, emotional tie to it. And then they see all these bright and shiny objects. And so they, they start grabbing at all of them. And um, I think they become a little um, vulnerable when they have to start hearing the guidance and advice from seasoned professionals who are like, no, there's a strategy. There's a way to win this business. There's you know a clear path that you should be taking. And they're throwing around terms and broker names and shipping, you know, um, terms and payment terms and co-man, you know, contracts that they have to enter into to scale to a certain size. And um, I think that just can be very intimidating. Um, so what we do at SKU is really touch on all the core aspects of um, a CPG business and really help them hone in and refine what, where they are, 
what they're trying to do, understand that bright, shiny objects then are going to constantly be coming their way and, you know, what to leave aside and what direction to take to really create like a solid business going forward. And I think that's true of all founders, um, not just, you know, founders of color. Um, I do think every once in a while some founders um, have a little bit of a leg up if they, you know, come from a larger CPG company, and so they know some of the terminology. Um, but a first-time founder um, in this area is typically, you know, going to need to know um, just the nomenclature, the vernacular, the terms, and get some guidance from seasoned professionals on, you know, pitfalls that they could avoid. Yeah. So it sounds like that's really. Um, you know, advice, a thread that's common with all three of you is that that's really how you build your confidence is that um, the feeling of not belonging, oftentimes it's us feeling uncomfortable because we don't know the culture or the, the nomenclature that people are using. So there, there's a lot of um, community-based groups. There's a lot of organizations and companies that are putting are making an effort around building a more diverse workforce. As all of these organizations launch diversity programs for founders of color or to bring in more employees of color, uh, what are some of the cultural parameters that the you know that these organizations should consider? I think it's one thing to say that you want to build a diverse um, workforce. It's another to actually create an environment where that is something that you can sustain. So, Joy, I would love to start off with you to talk about you know, Cook's Nook, the learnings from that. Um, I know you've done a lot of work with, with other founders. So yeah, I'd love to start with you. You're on mute. Joy, you're on mute. Duh. Um, what do we tell, <laughs> what do we have, well, how do our members create diverse workforces? Is that the question? Or corporates? Oops, you're on mute now. <laughs> Y'all, I am on hour seven of emceeing and this is the first time it's happened. I don't know what's going on. I'm just tired maybe. Well, so I think, you know, there's a lot of places, um, there's a lot of organizations launching programs. Yeah. So I think let's start with uh, community-based organizations that are launching programs, similar to something like Mo, uh, right. where, where it's geared towards founders of color. What, what are the cultural parameters these community-based groups should be thinking about as they are creating a program for founders of color? Sure. Uh, first, one of the things we always tell people is there are a lot of products and a lot of entrepreneurs out there. People or companies or organizations often have this misconception that they come from a position of bias because they haven't seen them and think they don't exist. They think they don't exist. And that is not the case. If you are in any communities, there are tons of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial families, and there are tons of products. They just may not have left the community yet. And it's your responsibility to go in and find them, not them to come to you. But if you are interested in those products and those products coming to market, then you need as the, as the, as the corporate to go in and to go find them. And, or you're the one having the program is to give a route, a path, and means for them to, for that, that road to, you know, to pave that road and that access, right? And to create that route. Um, and they do exist. And the way you find them is you actually know the community. <laughs> um, and you have to commit to that. And if you're gonna commit to that, then your business needs to reflect that and to show that. Um, it needs to be part of your mission statement, it needs to be part of your business. As we say, you say in tech, you need to eat your own dog food um, and you should have your own DNI commitments. It's really hard. And it's, I say it's inauthentic, it's not authentic. Um, and it rings hollow to have, to say we're committed and we're gonna run programs and your own organization does not look like that, does not act like that, does not breathe like that. It is not part of your own mission statement, it is not part of your own culture. Um, and I think communities can smell falsehood a mile away. And I'll just be honest. Um, yeah, and that's so, true. Um, and so um, if you truly want 
to engage with people, you have to be honest and authentic. Um, and so your corporation, your business, your organization needs to be committed. It needs to be part of your culture, whether it's your statements, your mission, um, your hiring practices, your procurement practices, um, whatever those things are, um, your advisory board, um, your leadership. It should be there, it should be visible. So there are no questions from that community about who you are and what you believe. And so that the hand that you're extending and the program that you're extending are believable. That help? Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's really important to to touch on. I think, you know, as we're as we're working with the community, we can't just create programs um, that we think that people will like or the or think that people will need, right? Did we ask them? Mm -hmm. um, and Bianca, I think you work with so many founders of color. I would really love to hear from you. What are some of those pain points that they talk about as far as, um, you know, when they're when they're in a program? Um, I think that that's really important for all of us to know because we are, we're all, you know, a lot of us are, are launching or working, um, you know, with programs like that, so. I think for the most part to understand that there's diversity within diversity, right? So um, not everybody needs the same thing. And my, my situation may be different from someone else's situation. So just know that if there are minority, there's diversity within all minorities, right? So who's your target market and how that you, how will you get those people to innately believe in that you're trying to do something for them? Because there's also a, not a trust factor there, right? Because Far too often what happens is that people will come into communities of colors and leverage their uh, great ideas, steal them and take them for themselves. So, you know, now that they, if they find a program that may seem too good to be true, even though your intent is great and you have their best interest at mind, they may not want to join the program and benefit from that program because it's like, oh, you know, what's in it for you? Why are you trying to help me? So when Joy talked about authenticity, that's a very important factor because people want to know that you're really trying to help me. And you're really trying, you really have my best interest without taking something from me because that's the biggest thing that my clients face. And it was like, well, if I join this and if I do this, you know, how much of my shares I'm gonna have to give up? It doesn't require equity, you know, do, will they really understand my product or will they take everything from me? So yeah. more anything there's diversity within diversity and making sure that whatever you do when you go into a community that you make them feel that you're trustworthy and mm -hmm. that only on you and not on them for sure because because that is the real experience of some families and many people in many communities that's real things were taken from them and yeah 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 i think it's just approaching that with respect yeah absolutely and so I think, Joy, you touched on, um, you know, organizations where leadership doesn't necessarily reflect the people that they serve. I know that um, sometimes that can take a lot of time. And what advice would you give organizations that, that are in that transition or starting that process? There is definitely some discomfort in that, right? Like if they, if it's something that they culturally believe that they want to tackle, but their leadership doesn't necessarily look like you know, well, it I still looks for, very right. Well, I mean, I think for entrepreneurs and smaller businesses, I think we have a real opportunity, right? We can move in a way that others that others cannot, right? It's different when we have that conversation. And I, I spent two, uh, eight years, I don't give too many years to it. You know, I spent eight years at Dell, and then I spent time at medium-sized companies and smaller companies, right? It was a different conversation at Dell, but that was always a pointed conversation, right? Um, you know, at a company of the size of the Cook's Nook, right? We now have about 25 employees at the Cook's Nook. It is, it is a commitment and it's very, it is pointed, directed, and can be done, right? We have that power at this level to do that. You know, you start to get bigger. And if you have not already made that as part of the core plan, as part of the DNA, it is there from day one, sure, it becomes more challenging. But even as you grow, you're 50, you're 100, you can still do those things, right? There, there comes a time 
that they do start to become more challenging. But I'm still a firm believer that the commitment is still the commitment. I mean, to, to talk to me when you're 25,000, then okay, then it looks, then, then the conversation is, is, is different. Right? But, I, you know, at the sizes I think that most of us are and that we're talking about, I'm, I'm not quite sure that's a real challenge yet. If that's the commitment that you want, you can do that. And you can make that investment and there's lots of different ways um, with the HR person, HR consultant, with your own vision, um, with the hiring pool and talent that we have here with organizations like Naturally Austin and others behind you or consulting with you, uh, folks like the Black Chamber or our Mecca Chambers as we call them, um, our uh, Hispanic Chamber, our Gay Chamber, our Young Chamber, um, they have resources to help di uh, direct you in the right way, our Texas Workforce Commission, um, to get you on the path that you want to be on if that is part of your corporate commitment. So sorry, I had to bounce off there. There's a calamity in the house. <laughs> uh, calamity. When there's blood, you know, it's real tears. Okay. Um, so I was just going to jump in and just talk about some of the things that I've seen some bigger businesses do to really promote diversity um, as we're under, uh, you know, having the conversation. And one just seems so simple, but I love the simplicity of it, where they started identifying people that they brought into their organization that were people of color or, you know, some other minority group and were able to build out a breadth of Applica applicants and candidates for additional positions by just saying, do you know anyone who you think we should be talking to to bring into this organization and almost having a referral program? Um, because typically there are some circles there, right? If you just keep on populating your you know, job search to certain niches or certain individuals, I mean, they're gonna have the, the same type of people around them. And taking that direct approach of just saying, you know, a person like you, I want five more of you applying for this job. It allows them sort of natural um, kind of growth within those diverse populations and big businesses. And, um, and and even within big businesses, right? The ERGs do a lot of this work in your larger companies, right? Your right. ERGs become a big key source for the HR organizations to try to build those circles. Uh, you know, inside some companies, they have what they call leadership books and resumes are on file, right? And it gives you nodding your head where those circles are built out. And so as roles come up and open, you already have books and circles that are potentially, you know, maybe giving away one of the big HR secrets that are potentially built out. But those kinds of things are not in the moment. Those are large strategies, yeah. right? that book and those circles ex already exist. You don't just show up suddenly and you're in the book or in a circle, right? Those are, those are built out over time, yeah. right? And your name comes up eventually in the book or in the circle, right? Exactly. And so there is a, even in bigger companies, when you do have that, those are, those can be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to wait your turn oftentimes even still in bigger companies for those opportunities. But I do love the lens focusing on this problem and really just being considerate about what they're doing and not just saying, yes, you know, we're out there, we've donated to a group, or of course we have a relationship here, but I feel like there's been a lot more actionable um, steps taken by companies. And I mean, I'll just use SKU as a great example and put myself out there. When I first took over, um, in track seven, I didn't even think about kind of that lens of diversity when selecting the companies to come into the program. And it didn't dawn on me until we actually had our first cohort event. And I looked and I'm like, okay, there's seven company and five of them are either women founded or minority owned. And I was just like, oh, Good work, but that's just naturally how the cohort came together. Now, fast forward, um, we were working on Minneapolis um, right as the time of George Floyd happened. And we were pulling in what companies we were gonna select for the cohort. And all of a sudden we were like, no, we are going to make sure that we have a diverse cohort. And it was just even that active intention change, which actually, you know, it didn't end up, you know, creating two different types of cohorts, 
but just with the education and kind of this heightened awareness and how, you know, how wonderful it turned out organically when that happened. I love now having just that framework and the intentionality around creating a diverse uh, cohort for um, for SKU. And, you know, it has been such a a great experience. And I think CPG is an industry where um, founders um, can come from all different walks of life. And so it allows for, you know, a broader representation to emerge. And I just um, feel blessed that we get to collectively all support that through our programming and our connections and what we're able to do. Here's yeah, the, I'm sorry, go ahead, Katrina. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say it when she said it earlier, I really appreciate that and I like that because I know more people like me than not, right? So if you're you're talking to me and I know all these people and I can offer somebody up to you, that means that that person would have never gotten into the room if I wouldn't have offered them up. So I love that you all are willing to like look at a person that's of a particular kind of person and know that that person associates with other people that just is good. But at the same time, even if they have somebody that they're mentoring, they can bring them along the way with them because that's important for me. I don't expect any of my clients to know the things that I know just for me to bring them along the way. And you mentioned George Floyd family, right? George Floyd, George Floyd, George Floyd family is my clients, right? So they don't know a lot of these things, but I mean, one of them is starting a CD company. You know, one of them is doing you know, so many other things. One is starting a funeral home. You know, there are so many things out there that people don't know, but if they meet people that's in a circle that's willing to bring them up with them, then we just broke another barrier down in in light of diversity and inclusion to give more people at a seat at the seat at the table that wouldn't have had it before. So I actually like that aspect of what you just said. Well, and we can't have this conversation without touching on George Floyd um, and the events from last year. There's been some big social and cultural shifts that came like a tidal wave after that. And I'd love to know how you have perceived the change in support for minority owned brands. Has it changed and in, and in what way? Oh, yes, I can go on and on. I, um, a couple of years ago, for me personally, you know, being in the financial sector, my roster has grown exponentially. Um, I was just highlighted by a whole banking institution, right? I'm not saying that what my work, my work is not excellent because I put everything into what I have. But, you know, I don't know if ever before that a bank would have took the time to highlight me. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So I feel like what would happen with him it have opened up doors that I can walk in that I knew before that when I tried to get into these doors that I couldn't have, you know? And it's not that me going in and saying that, hey, you know, I know George Floyd's family. No, that's not it. It's them recognizing somebody in the community is doing a good job and I'm sending referrals to the bank and these people have proper financial statements or I'm on panels like this and I'm talking about the things that, you know, could improve our community that people are now willing to listen and say, hey, you know, they have a point over there. They're really trying. I can go as far back as the pandemic and how my clients fared out in the pandemic. Um, they had their stuff together. I believe in financial statements. It's the accountant in me that will not let my clients not have financial statements. So when it was time for them to get PPPs and EIDLs, they got money on the first round, whereas there were a whole subgroup of people that couldn't even get funding because they didn't understand the preparation of their tax returns and how line 31 mattered more than people even cared to on a schedule, no, on a schedule C and how um, like taking write-offs and just just really filing their taxes the correct way. Those are things that people don't know and they don't know what they don't know, right? So it takes people like us to educate them and say, hey, let's pour into you through this MO Accelerator, through SKU, through Naturally Austin, through all of these other initiatives. Like I did a a Madam CJ Walker Accelerator, right? So we had a group of women and they they have all these amazing products, but you know, they didn't know how to conduct business. So I I said all that to say that it becomes full circle when last year we collectively all sit down 
and we was forced to pay attention to the reality of everything that was going on around us and saw that there was um there was less equality than we imagined um, that we had and that the equity that people were of color was receiving was even lower. So now let's collectively work on how we could make sure that equality happens and then get equity for people that have similar backgrounds and stories so that we can be equal across the board. What about you, Joy? What what have you perceived in the change of support for minority-owned brands? Um, I'm probably a bit more sanguine, but you know I tend to be a bit more sanguine. Um, I think it was it was huge last summer in spring and summer. It was it was unreal, um, and I, I use the word unreal very specifically. Um, I think the interest in in bipod brands was unheard of um my phone wouldn't stop ringing with requests for recommendations in a variety of sectors and arenas of course food and f and d but even outside of that which is wonderful because it gave us the opportunity to highlight just like everybody here on on in this meeting in this session and folks we've always wanted to talk about and do talk about right you gave you had the moment to talk about them the the biggest concern was um even the conversations then was how sustainable was it going to be and what does that mean and how much would the brands care the big brands who were calling care or the individual investors who were calling and care, or groups of investors who were calling them, and how long would they care? Um, and as the brands, and I'll separate from the investors, as the brands found their outlets to direct, direct their energies and their funds for whatever reason, that did begin to drop off by the end of fall, right? Um, they made their commitments for them, you know, for a good chunk of them. And a lot of them have gone a lot quieter. What that looks like in 2021, or sorry, 2022, let's say, because many of their commitments would have gone through summer to fall into 2021. All right. It'll be interesting to see what that means to, to companies in 2022. So my recommendations to many of those BIPOC founders was, so whatever you're going to do, do it very quickly and put your company into a good position. Whatever that, whatever that means, right? Um, you know, not to say, well, you know, brands and companies are fickle. I'll just be honest, they just are, right? They have their obligations to their shareholders, their partners, whatever their bottom lines are, and they just do. Um, that's the nature of business. Um, you know, for investors, um, many of the ones who did call and were looking for appropriate investments, they were still looking for the right companies. They were still being very targeted about their requests and their asks. They were still looking for the, the right investment to make that was still going to give them the trajectories that they wanted. Um, so, you know, their interests were still targeted. It wasn't just as broad as the brands had been. Um, and I'm sure they're they're still in it for those, you know, they're still going to make those target investments over over time. Uh, so just very different from the brands. Um, but whatever scenarios, you know, um, entrepreneurs found themselves in, the you know the recommendation was the same: be thoughtful, have a plan about what you're going to do with the funds, or whatever you're getting, or whatever you're you're getting involved in, um, and set yourself up as best as possible for success this interest in food um, and this, uh, you know, whatever, however it comes to be, um, may or may not last forever. So, you know, make your plan. But like I said, I tend to be fairly sanguine, right? It's just something you have to know about me. <laughs> Well, Joy, I'm just going to dovetail on that because I do think this is such a great time where the eyes are on it, interest yeah. level is high, right. and 
just to capitalize on it in the ways that you can. And I think collectively in our, as, you know, our joint efforts, whether it's this MO track we're doing together, um, let's make it a point to get businesses in these financial positions to be able to speak to all the business areas that investors look for. So investors start, you know, getting comfortable, getting excited about looking towards minority businesses. And, you know, I think so much of what happens with both angel investors and funds and, you know, all the investment community is they start, you know, you recognize patterns. That's how they can sort through deals faster. So if the pattern then becomes, we have these very solid businesses that happen to be minority founded um, or run, um, they're used to seeing it. The good ones bubble up to the top and you are just using this opportunity to create a different pattern of thinking because you're right. Like, you know, there's still business metrics and financial metrics that have to be met from investors and we're never going to get away, you know, around that, but just to recondition what they're looking for and how they approach um, the business opportunities that are presented to them and the deal opportunities. I think we just got to capitalize this and do what we can oh, to just point. create this wave and, you know, move it forward and really change you know what um oh, that's, that's what a good point Christian. and 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 if it's the opportunity is really for us to whisper in their ears and say rethink this and look at all the folks that have bubbled up and all that you know here's here's 17 names right here's 17 folks who are running really good business you know really good companies that you would have not have looked at before this year this past year and you be put in front of you they're running really great businesses that that's that's awesome. And if it teaches them, this is how you can always find them. <laughs> this is where they are. This is what they're doing. And, it, and it's re-educating a whole crowd of folks. You're, you're absolutely right. Maybe I should be less sanguine. <laughs> Just hang out with me more often. I'm I know. I know. <laughs> but I love the I love the moment that we just had here, right? It's 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 different viewpoints that are coming together. I mean, that's what this is about. And as you can see, I have a guest host here that's been trying to climb in my lap for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> this is Autumn. Um, I think one of the things that I'd love to talk about is we have we have brands in the audience, but we are also all consumers. What are some of the customer habits and trends that open up opportunities for diversity in CPG? I mean, I think, you know, um, ethnic food has definitely become more, more comfortable for people to consume. And so I'd love to, I'd love to talk a little bit about that and, and what our role as consumers can be in this conversation. Um, one trend that I've been seeing lately and I'm really excited about is this, um, healthy Tex-Mex or Mexican Hispanic food demand, right? And I think Siete is a great example. Um, and we have an another company going through our current SKU program right now, um, Agua Benita, which is a better for you alfa fresca in a can and it's amazing. And I just love seeing the demand from the consumers in this space. And then the founders that are really innovating a, a pretty, you know, traditional um, category in food. So, I mean, it's, it's fun when there's like this equal part of consumer pull for the brands and innovation and, you know, enough white space to really, you know, create some healthy amount of innovation. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, about you, Bianca or Joy? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, okay. Bianca. That's not her fault. Oh, no. Go to <laughs> okay. Um, I think my things we're seeing is that, um, there's a whole audience of folks that we don't think about who are consumers of food and acquirers of food. Um, and they are those who actually are food insecure and that there is a real opportunity to bring food to the market. Um, that people who are, I'll stop that sentence and finish and come back to it. That those who are food insecure are deserving of good food and make food choices and drive our market. They are purchasers and consumers and still want and need food that fit their dietary needs, their religious needs, um, and have quality food that is that fits their budgets and cultural um, and cultural needs. Um, and that's real. And how do we do that? Um, and how do we have food at a, at a variety of price points um, that works? 
um, in Travis County, one of the wealthiest counties in the United States of America. 25% of the children in this county are food insecure. 21% of adults are food insecure in this county. They do not know where their meals are coming from. Um, it was exacerbated by COVID. It was exacerbated by this storm, um, the winter storm. Um, this city had a food supply problem. We have less than two days of food access in this city. Um, we were asked in this sector, which is already a decimated sector, to try to feed people when we had no food access. Um, two day of the storm during ice, we had emergency calls because literally there was no food and there was starting to be fighting in the shelters and the warming centers because there was no food plan and no food access. And I was asked to go in and teams were asked to go in when we had let our staffs off because it was unsafe for folks to travel and to go in and actually attempt to make food and make meals to go out to the parts of this city. That is how tenuous it is. Less than 1% of the food that is consumed in Travis County is actually made in Travis County. We ship everything in. Wow. That's heavy. Um, and if we do not gain a foothold in that, we will always, we will be this way. We are still trying to feed people in this county from that storm. We were behind. And so there's a reason why the cooks nook. While we have our entrepreneurial business and other business, we also make 3,000 meals a day that go out across Travis County. And to do so quality, and they're asking for it, and they're asking for quality food. And that can include entrepreneurial food. It can include your food. Your food is quality food, whether it's a yogurt or a cookie or, or a trail mix <laughs> or, or a tortilla, right? Or a chip or whatever that may be. Don't discount your food to those who need it. Yeah? Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that, Joy. Bianca, you were going to say something? I also have another dog trying to get in my lap, so I'm gonna put <laughs> myself on mute. Oh, I think Bianca's frozen. Bianca, are you frozen? It looks like she might be. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kirsten, how about we we come back to you on um, the trends I'm piece? Sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean to distress y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to hear about some of the trends that you've seen um in in the last couple of skew tracks have there been some some trends uh that help can help um open up opportunities for diversity in cpg well i mean trends in the consumer space or trends that skew because i think you know just even yeah that lens like it's true about before um and then partnering to do this program and being able to find so many companies that are excited to support it so many mentors that are excited to come in and mentor. I mean, when Bianca and I first met, when she was helping Sienna Sauce, we had this fantastic conversation about what she was doing. And I was like, I need you involved. And so I do think there's a lot of trends just, um, I also have another <laughs> trying to get in my life. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, just active concerted effort to, you know, um, to, you know, support the community um, and, and just grow and make the, you know, lasting changes that we need. Hold on one second. But from a consumer perspective, I do think there is information and drive to get the social circles and digital um, and communities together to really support, support the brands as well. Well, this is that time of day, y'all, when, when every, every, oh, I have, am I echoing now? I think Bianca's on twice and she might be echoey bouncing. What about now? Oh. 
Okay, what about now? Is that better? Yeah. Y'all, yeah, I just have a lot of uh, technology around me in case stuff like this happens. So uh, it's, I was just saying that it's that time of day when all the animals and the kiddos are, are ready for our days to end. And so I think since we have a couple of minutes left, I would love to hear from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone uh, you know, want to share a story? I think one of the big things that I'd love to hear about is what are some of the ways that we can serve you? What's missing in this ecosystem? Anyone from the audience? Mo Fellows, I know you're in there. I see you. Nana, I see you. <laughs> I would say, I know, I see Mo Fellows. Okay, fine. <laughs> and I see Dave Foreman out there too. No questions. Something. And All Rebecca. of an Yeah, go ahead. You know. Hi guys. So I'm Maria. I'm from Colombia okay. originally, but I've lived in Texas for the past 10 years. And so thank you for creating this kind of environment because it's uh, really, I truly believe in the American dream, but these kind of spaces really reiterate that there is a reason why the American dream is true. So thank you. Um, and so, you know, as today is the day to celebrate because we're celebrating women in, uh, you know, International Day of Women. Why don't you guys share a story like of inspiration of like, you know, something that you had to overcome maybe because of a minority and like you just came out stronger the other side. I can tell my story. <laughs> Mine uh, started with my age, right? When I was 24 years old, I was appointed as CFO of a city in Franklin, Louisiana, where I'm originally from. And so um, I had to overcome a lot just to show up and prove that I belong there. So my, my life existed in a way that I couldn't enjoy my 20s at all. So my friends and my family members and my sisters, they have all of these great college stories. And I'm like, well, where was I, you know, when this happened? But I had to study real obscure lines in a city budget book because I knew that the city council was going to ask me a question because they felt like I didn't belong. Right. So it made me study extra harder and it made me become more smarter and stronger and uh, just more aware of the things that I was going to say when I did get to those meetings on the first Thursday of every month. So it made me become very diligent. And from there, it, it made me strive to become a better version of myself at all times. But at the same time, never treat anybody like I was treated and always, you know, just give people the benefit of doubt and really, really help them. And so in, in doing that, it opened up my career up even more because it gave me uh, a better worth ethic, right? So that if someone had came to me with a question that I would have to answer because I always study to show myself approved. And I always show up in a way that, okay, I can answer these questions because I did the research and that I really know what I'm talking about. And every tax season of my company, even though my focus is business financials, I treat it the same way now because I never want a client to come walk into my door and a tax law has changed and I misinformed them because I didn't have the wherewithal to continually educate myself. So when you go into these spaces and you become, you know, bigger in your business and your company grow, make sure that continuous education component of it stick with you because no one is going to know your business more than you do. And I never want any founder to lose that. So just like do the things that got you there, stay passionate about what you do and never let anybody make you feel less than like you don't belong at the table. And when you do get to the table, please bring people along with you that look like you, women, you know, minorities and people that won't necessarily be there innately because there was times when even when I left city government and politics, I worked at AIG as an accounting manager and was tasked with going to Dubai and India to teach the accounting systems. So, you know, people still didn't think that I belong there. So, you know, whenever you're somewhere, you make sure people remember you and know for a fact that you belong there. 
Well, that's a mic drop moment. I don't know about you. <laughs> Sorry.